Good morning. Welcome to Air Force Now. I'm Major General Jack B. Ferris, Jr., commander of the 2nd Infantry Division, and we're in Korea on a very cold morning. And out there, just about 10 kilometers to your north, is a demilitarized zone separating North Korea from South Korea. What we're going to do is show you how the Air Force and the Army does it in Korea. <laughs> Yeah, three of this is night box four five. We have a special mission for this morning. June 1950. North Korea launches a massive surprise attack against the Republic of Korea. Three years later, a ceasefire was signed. That ceasefire is still in effect today. Propaganda Village, a ghost town. Although uninhabited, Propaganda is broadcast from here up to 12 hours a day, mostly at night. A Soviet citizen broke away from his tour group attempting to defect to the free world. Korean soldiers chased him into the United Nations portion of the area. A 30-minute firefight between ROC U.S. forces and North Korean soldiers took place. The date 23 November, 1984. The incident claimed three North Korean lives. The price for this defector's freedom was one Republic of Korea soldier's life. Well, we all participate in what the Air Force and the Army have decided to call the Air Land Battle Doctrine. And the Air Force plays a very important part in that. Process. For example, for this division, they provide us the ability to fight deeper than we could ordinarily fight with our own weapons. They also provide us close air support. And I can take an Air Force commander out here and give him a particular mission out on the ground to delay an enemy force or to destroy an enemy force or to destroy his lines of communication to keep him from moving towards the flock. They use the A-10s, they use F-4s, close air support roll. We also take our Cobra gunships and do JAT missions with them, where the A-10s and the Cobras actually work together to bring joint firepower to bear on the target. Air Force fires, the Army fires, with both the ROC and the U.S. Army, we can bring devastating firepower to bear out here upon any enemy that attacks us. Right for that. Hazard. High terrain to the north. No fly line. One, one five nautical miles northwest. Lost comm. Fly VFR 160 degrees. Contact Kingstar. Drive POV Tango 4. Heading 088. Distance 6.5. I'm Gary Christopher. I'm Tech Sergeant Air Force. I'm a uh, Chief of Operations of 1st Brigade TACPs here at Camp Casey in Korea. The job that these guys do is very important. 
It's going to help the Army sustain and survive on the battlefield. That is probably the most important facet of their job. It's going to keep our people alive by allowing them to mass firepower where it's needed and give them the full range of options that are necessary to survive on a modern battlefield. It's important to the Army because they rely on us heavily. The Army doesn't just do tanks and tracks. The Army's got people who walk for a living and people that fly in helicopters. And they've got people that jump out of perfectly good airplanes who live with what they carry on their back. We don't have any choice because they do rely on us that much. We're glad to have the Air Force uh, as part of the Air Land Battle Team. And the Air Force and the Army right now, through a lot of initiatives that uh, we have together, are working better than they ever have in the past. I've got Air Force solid air controls assigned right to this division. They work with us, they uh, eat with us in our mess, they play with us all the time, and they go out and they fight with us. And we're just part of a team, and this business of doing operations service unique is a thing of the past. It's going to be joint, and in most cases, it's going to be combined. That's the way we're going to fight. By God, that's the way we're going to try. In December 1972, Negotiations at the Paris Peace Conference were once more deadlocked. Hopes to bring the POWs home by Christmas faded. The situation demanded strong, positive action toward North Vietnam. Action came on December 18, 1972. Operation codename, Linebacker 2. Hundreds of aircraft flew 729 sorties against 34 North Vietnamese key complexes. Three crew members from the lead B-52 were interviewed in 1973. They were tail gunner Master Sergeant Reg Martin, navigator Captain Paul Winkler, aircraft commander Major John Dalton. Prior to the mission, uh, none of us knew what uh, where our target would be that night. Uh, we knew something big was up, being that no one was flying that day. They were saving all the sorties uh, for later that night. And we walked into our briefing and we we saw where our target was going to be, and everybody looked and just stared at the at the drawing board. After the first couple nights, they did lose a few aircraft. The hardest part for me was going into the briefing room and where you're all friends, where they have all the crews assembled for the main briefing and looking around and wondering if there were any of your friends there that wouldn't make it back that night. Field of thoughts was from why me ranging up to, uh, it's about time that we're going up and doing this. Maybe we can get our prisoners back. On the second flight of the raids, Major Dalton's crew was again in the lead B-52. Just after a bomb drop over Hanoi, their aircraft sustained serious battle damage from a surface-to-air missile. Everyone kept the cool, and with the damage we had, we got back out and back into friendly territory, which was relief, and uh, made an emergency landing at, at a northern base in Thailand. We had some very good friends after the first night or POWs. Um, it melt, meant a little bit more when you knew somebody on the ground it was a POW down there. Now that they are back, um, it's a thing of the past. Uh, I'm glad we did it. I'm, I'm sure it played an important part. For his part in Linebacker 2, Major Dalton was awarded the Silver Star. The rest of the crew received the Distinguished Flying Cross. Linebacker 2 was one of the largest and most successful air operations in history. On January 27, 1973, at the International Conference Center in Paris, formal agreement on ending the war in Vietnam was signed by representatives of the United States and the People's Republic of North Vietnam. Two weeks later, February 12, 1973, the first of the captured POWs were released in Hanoi.
Brooks Air Force Base, Texas, home of the Human Systems Division and the Air Force Drug Testing Laboratory. This laboratory, one of nine Department of Defense drug abuse detection facilities, is the only Air Force agency implementing the joint Army Air Force drug abuse testing program. I'm Colonel Bob Grosner, and I'm commander of the Air Force Drug Testing Laboratory at Brooks Air Force Base, Texas. The mission of the laboratory is simply to deter drug abuse in the Air Force. We test all samples that come into the laboratory for marijuana and cocaine. Additionally, we test 10% of those samples for amphetamines, barbiturates, PCP, or opiates. In the future, we will be testing for designer drugs. In fact, any substance that can be abused. The drug testing laboratory uses two state-of-the-art tests to detect the presence of drugs by urinalysis. Specimens are first tested using a procedure called radioimmunoassay, or RIA. This test is very sensitive, measuring drug metabolites in parts per billion. If a urine specimen tests positive for a drug using this procedure, a second test is performed to confirm the presence of the drug. The second test, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, or GCMS, is the most sensitive and specific method of drug detection now in use. GCMS is a two-part test, which can identify the unique fingerprint of any drug being tested. From the moment of collection, an unbroken chain of custody begins. All urine specimens arrive at the laboratory under this strict chain of custody. Seals that are placed on each sample in the field are examined to be sure they've not been tampered with in any way. Unique identifying numbers on the specimen bottles are matched to numbers on the accompanying chain of custody documents. Chain of custody continues the entire time the specimens are in the laboratory. Today, the security of the laboratory resembles Fort Knox. Every entrance to the laboratory has a cipher locked door. Every time someone leaves the employee of the drug testing laboratory, that combination is changed. Within the workings of the laboratory, where the specimens are kept, there are additional controlled access doors. After ours, these doors are set with an intrusion alarm system. When the lab is unattended, there are motion detectors in two rooms of that section to ensure the samples are not tampered with. The Air Force Drug Testing Laboratory plays a key role in helping field commanders maintain an operationally ready force. Using advanced laboratory technology, a dedicated team of scientists and technicians analyze more than a quarter million specimens each year. The quality of their work is unmatched. The procedures used by and the results of the drug testing lab are scientifically accepted and will support disciplinary action. The bottom line is that if Air Force military personnel are doing drugs and they're identified, they're subject to punishment. The lab's evidence will hold up in court. Yeah.